my channel. My name is Martine, and if you are new here, I do videos on Vedic astrology mainly, but also with some tropical insights, and I focus on both relationship and natal astrology. And if you like this video and you would like to see more content from me, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to my channel, also consider clicking the notifications bell if you want to see when I will post a new video. Also, if you are interested in a private reading, I do readings in astrology on a variety of topics ranging from relationship readings to career to transits for two, three years or solar return charts or predictions for one year, etc. You are free to email me at the email address that I will leave in the video description and I can send you a pricing list and reading options and any other details that you might require. Also, I want to mention that I have started membership options on this channel, and the short of it, just to give you the short perks that you will get if you choose to join the membership section, you will get one extra video per month for each membership stage or tier. So for the first tier, you will get one video, one extra video per month, for the second tier, you will get two extra videos per month, so you will have access to level one and level two videos. And for level three or third tier, you will get three extra videos per month. Uh, the level one and level three videos are going to be on ver a variety of topics, so basically anything related to astrology. But it will be content that is not shown on my regular um, you know, my regular usual videos, right? So this is members only exclusive content and it can range from, you know, tips and tricks on how to read a horoscope to, um, I haven't done this yet, but I plan on doing maybe members only um, astrological synastry for famous couples, for instance, or um, the analysis of famous people's horoscopes, but then I can also get into divisional charts, etc., etc. So all kinds of things. The level one or second tier of membership options is especially related to synastry astrology topics, meaning relationship-oriented astrology. So this could be things like how to discover which kind of partner archetype is right for you according to your horoscope um, or it could be again different characteristics you know whether you're going to have a good marriage according to your horoscope or a less than stellar marriage but you can find more concrete examples in the lists that you will find in the video description um, because I have added the playlists where you can already see all the videos that I have posted in each member's section. So yeah, you can see what videos you will have access to uh, from the ones that I have already done. But I will continue to post, like I said, one extra video per month for each level of membership. And in addition to that, in the members only section, you will have access to members only polls. And you will also have priority when it comes to getting your comments replied to you on my channel and you will also have stickers that basically show up next to your username that show that you are a member um, and a couple of exclusive emojis all right so that's pretty much all the perks that you can have as a member on my channel if you're curious you can check the video description for more details as well, or you can click the join button under any of my videos to also see the prices because the prices will be shown in your local currency. All right. In addition to the members only section, I also have a tarot channel and I post there semi-regularly and I will be linking the tarot channel in the video description as well as in the pinned comment uh, it's called Martine's Tarot. So if you are curious about tarot, if you're into it, maybe check out my channel, maybe subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much for listening to this intro. And now I'm going to get straight into today's topic. So hello and welcome to the synastry of Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck. So I have taken your advice and am going to kind of improvise this uh, screen recording thing. I hope it turns out well. Um, this is the first time that I'm doing this, but I have taken some of y'all 
uh, y'all's advice because you want to see me pointing to the placements as I go along. So I'm going to try to do that. Uh, so let me know in the comments if this makes a difference. I mean, if you like this a lot more than just me showing static photos of the horoscopes. All right, so this is the sinistry part. I'm going to start with Jennifer Lopez's um, placements, actually with Ben Affleck's placements on the outside. So as you can see here on the outside, uh, with the red, we have Ben Affleck's placements, and on the inside with the blue, there are Jennifer Lopez's placements. So basically, this is a sinistry overlay, which allows us to see you know, how, what aspects are forming here. So, you know, conjunctions are the easiest, but the rest of them will follow. Um, so, and, and most specifically, when you have overlays, you get to see one person's planets, like here, Ben Affleck's planets, how they fall onto her houses, you know, so which areas of life are being influenced. So, the first thing that stands out to me, honestly, is this Saturn-Venus conjunction. I have done a video speaking about the Venus-Saturn conjunction and how it can lead to abuse in relationships. I don't feel like this is a situation of abuse because, at least based on the information that has come out about them, I don't know of any allegations of abuse, especially since he is the one with the Saturn, so it's usually the Saturn person who's kind of controlling towards the Venus person. With respect to issues connected to control, who knows, they might be present. Some of you maybe who have uh, watched that video might remember that I have mentioned how when you have this conjunction, especially the person who's the Saturn could be trying to control the finances of the Venus person. But especially also in this case, she be her being the Venus person, he might also try to control, like, her beauty and her seductiveness to some extent. I don't know. Because, again, to be fair, I haven't done, like, in-depth research into their dynamic. I know that they had an on-again, on kind of off-again. I mean, they were connected before and now they got back together. So I'm not 100% sure what is going on there. Maybe he is controlling. I mean, this would definitely explain that. Um, but it could also just be that they feel they are doing something together, especially since they are both creative. The conjunction between Saturn and Venus could also point to um, like a kind of mutually beneficial relationship on very pragmatic terms. Um, maybe they feel like they have a better financial situation together. Um, they could even maybe somehow inspire one another to do creative work. But again, I would have to like do some kind of in-depth research into their relationship to confirm that. Um, with respect to his Saturn falling into her ninth... Um, this is also getting me the feeling that he might be triggering some kind of daddy issues. I mean, if she has any, but then everyone has mommy and daddy issues. That's my theory anyway. Um, let's not also forget that Saturn being here in Taurus is also opposite her moon and Mars, which is really interesting. Maybe this explains why they separated after a while only to get back together, you know, after a long time. Um, we have the Saturn-Mars opposition, which basically is, like, here we have Mars and here we have Saturn. So the opposition here is also a potentially problematic aspect. Some of you, again, might remember that I've also done a video on Mars-Saturn aspects, especially the hard ones. The conjunction opposition in the square can point out to a dynamic of push and pull, of control issues... Um, like, especially the Saturn person, again, tends to be the more controlling one. And again, especially since it's her Mars, it can kind of heighten situations of him wanting to control her sexuality, maybe feeling threatened by her sexuality, her overt displays of sexuality, especially because Mars is more extroverted. Everyone has a Mars, so everyone has a kind of, you know, a way that they go hunting in a way sexually. That's what Mars shows. So, especially when you have this between the woman's Mars and the man's Saturn, again, it can kind of trigger control issues. 
and um, can also mean that the woman tends to react aggressively towards the Mars person, sorry, the Saturn person. But it also depends on, you know, how self-aware they each are and how much they care about each other to work things out. And then we also have the Moon-Saturn opposition, which is honestly, again, quite challenging because Saturn tends to be critical of the Moon. I wouldn't be surprised if he perceives her to be too emotional sometimes, especially since she also has this conjunction happening in her horoscope, which basically tends to make her more impulsive, more passionate, whereas with him here playing the Saturn in this interaction, he might tend to feel threatened a little bit uh, by her energy, by her sexuality, especially since, again, we have this conjunction in Scorpio, which makes um, the moon debilitated, so makes the Mars have a bit of the upper hand here. Um, which would make her, you know, very passionate, very fiery, especially in the eyes of this little Saturn here. <laughs> so bear in mind that I'm not talking about Ben Affleck as a whole right now. I'm talking about Ben Affleck from the perspective of his Saturn. Like, what is his inner Saturn archetype feeling when he is looking at her Moon-Mars conjunction? All right. This is something that I see. Oh, yeah. This time I decided to include the mean Lilith. So I might do like a video at some point in the future talking about Lilith and Sinistry because I have had some interesting findings in the meantime, even though at one point I said that I, you know, I mean, for a while I really ignored Lilith, uh, especially after I switched to Vedic. But anyway, parenthesis, they have the conjunction here. All right. So she has her Lilith conjunct his Venus. This is actually... Actually, this is exactly the aspect that I thought about talking about in a separate video. So again, I might do a separate video in not too long after this. Um, but I've seen this in sinistries of on and off obsessive connections. And again, especially since he is the Venus and she is the Lilith. Now, I have heard some rumors that said that he's just interested in her money and stuff like that. Honestly, at least looking at this conjunction, I would say that if anything, he's the one who is kind of mesmerized by her sexually more than anything else. So who knows what has been going on in their intimate situations because maybe he was just hooked <laughs> is all I'm going to say. You know, this conjunction especially creates a very, very strong attraction, like very instinctive, um, you know, like, to the point that it makes people that are incompatible by conventional measures really stick together just because they're so obsessed with one another. So, in a way, it is similar to Pluto, but not quite. So, again, might do a more in-depth video at some point uh, in the future. And with her, like I said, with her being the Lilith in this equation, it's most likely him that is completely hypnotized and mesmerized by her beauty and her sexuality. Yeah. Um, and they probably have good intimacy, is all I'm going to say. So, aside from that, we also have, look at this, the conjunction between, oh, they have a double conjunction between Sun, Mercury, Sun, Mercury. This is a very strong indicator that they are compatible intellectually, all right? So, they probably have good conversations and they probably have no problems understanding one another, like talking things out, which ultimately is very important in any relationship, right? Because if you can understand each other and talk things through and see things from a rational, detached, um, lighthearted perspective, a lot of issues can be resolved, right? So makes sense. And then let me actually, let me check another thing. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We also have the mars K2 conjunction here, which points towards a karmic situation. Why do I say that? Because Rahu, so this is her Rahu here. Um, her Rahu is falling in Aquarius, which means that K2 will be directly opposite in Leo, and his Mars is in Leo, right? So it means that she has her K2 conjunct his Mars. So again, the Mars K2 conjunction is again another aspect that I have talked about in a separate video. I uh, The video I think is called Mars conjunct Rahu slash K2. And I did talk about how this is one of those aspects that could point to aggression in a relationship, anger issues, 
So maybe the reason they've gotten together after a long time is because it took them a long time to cool off <laughs> with some arguments that they have had. I have also mentioned in that video that um, actually Johnny Depp and Amber Heard have this exact aspect as well in Sinistry. And now, to be fair, again, there is no single one aspect that can be a deal breaker in a relationship. But I did mention there that the conjunction between Mars and Ketu or Rahu can show anger issues, aggressions, the two partners basically pushing each other's buttons. But on the plus side, when you have the Ketu-Mars conjunction, it shows that most of the anger issues are played out at the onset of the relationship. Um, but as I also have mentioned in that video, again, I said that don't count on it to fizzle out because just like in the Amber Heard and Johnny Depp situation, um, you know, the question is like exactly how far does it have to go before all of the anger gets, you know, purged from the two people's systems, basically is what I'm trying to say, because I mean, sure, um, it might be highest at the onset of the relationship and then decrease with time, but that doesn't mean that you can't be at each other's throats at the beginning of a relationship, in which case it's probably not worth continuing it, as we have seen with the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case, is all I'm going to say. However, on the plus side, this shows not just that anger issues are going to be resolved with time, but it can also be a glue with respect to having a good physical relationship again. Another thing is, um, actually, oh yeah, now that I'm looking at this, they also have his Mars square. So here I'm going to switch towards the more tropical aspects because again, because again, I have mentioned I go by what works. So what I have seen is that Mars squares also happen. I mean, even if you look at it actually from the Vedic perspective in this situation, um, you still have a single-sided aspect from his Mars to her Moon-Mars conjunction. Because Mars aspects the fourth placement from itself. So one, two, three, four. All right. So his Mars, okay, Vedic or tropical, however you want to look at it, is aspecting her moon Mars conjunction. The only difference is that in tropical, you would see this as a mutual aspect, which means that not only is his Mars squaring her Mars, but her Mars is squaring his Mars and her moon is squaring his Mars as well. But if you look at it from the uh, Vedic perspective, it's a single-sided aspect. So that means his Mars is influencing her conjunction, but her conjunction is not doing anything to his Mars. All right. Either way, it would show an increase in passion, physical attraction, a lot of fieriness again. Um, again, this is also potentially, it's one of those aspects, just like the conjunction, although not as strongly, right? Um, meaning the Moon-Mars conjunction. In Sinistry, it's a very strong physical attraction aspect, and especially when it, it comes from the woman's moon to the man's Mars, it's a very kind of traditionally um, attractive aspect in a heterosexual couple. I've talked, again, I have done a video <laughs> that is probably to this day my most viewed video the Moon-Mars conjunction or Moon-Mars aspects in Sinistry. So you can go check that out because I have gone through a lot of famous couples examples as well in that uh, video and describe the whole dynamic in depth and in case you want to find out more about it. But all I'm going to say is this adds to the passion, to the fire. Um, this also adds to her seeing him as a, a really masculine figure, you know. Yeah. And let's see. Aside from that, let's see. So his Rahu is here in Capricorn, which means that his Ketu... All right, so they already have, like, uh, I can see that they're stuck in their comfort zones. What can I say? Um, and again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I also will recommend another video that I did, which is about how to read Rahu Ketu in the horoscope and in Sinistry. So um, very briefly, Rahu shows the destination that you are meant to reach in this lifetime, the lessons you are meant to learn. And K2, which is the opposite point, shows the past life. So in other words, your comfort zone. And I've also mentioned this in, uh, in that video or in multiple other videos, that when you see a lot of K2 um, conjunctions in Sinistry, it means that the two people are 
holding each other in their comfort zones, right? So, or they see each other as a comfort zone, right? But the downside to these kinds of connections is that they're not really growing on a spiritual level, you know, because they might be keeping each other in a place where they each feel comfortable, um, but they're not learning the lessons that Rahu wants them to learn in this lifetime, right? On the other hand, when you see Rahu conjunctions, it could show very strong, un unexplainable attractions, but they ultimately might become too uncomfortable for the people to pursue long term. And I have talked about uh, multiple couples who have this famous couples and how it plays out. So in this situation, they do have uh, already mutual K2 conjunctions. All right. So she has her K2 conjunct his Mars and he has his K2 conjunct her son Mercury. This is really kind of weird also because I mean, let me not get too philosophical, but let's just say the son is um, the father figure. Again, <laughs> I don't know why I'm getting daddy issues here, so I'm, I'm going to shut up. Um, yeah, but it could be like maybe she's working out some kind of weird daddy issues or something through this relationship. But the son figure, yeah, could be an authority figure. It could show that in a past life they were a parent and child or one of them was the leader of the other. It could also be that they were siblings in a past life. Even more weird. Okay, let's not dwell on the past life aspect. In any case, the K2 conjunctions would also show an instant feeling of deja vu and familiarity between the two of them so yeah I could explain why they keep going back to one another and then on a more practical level as I have also mentioned in a video where I did um, Sun conjunct Rahu or Ketu in Sinistry when you have um, the woman's moon sorry when you have the man's Ketu like in this case you have the man's Ketu so here's his Rahu in Capricorn and his Ketu is in Cancer somewhere over here so yeah conjunct um conjunct the mercury sun conjunction that she has this is actually a positive aspect to have at least from very traditional patriarchal views <clears throat> even according to traditional vedic astrologies astrologers sorry because it weakens the woman's ego over time. So as the relationship progresses, it means that her ego gets smaller in this relationship. Uh, which, according to, you know, the gossip and everything about Jennifer Lopez, sounds like is a positive, healthy thing for her. <laughs> so, yeah, there it is. Um, the conjunction to K2 might even show that they have some very kind of strong mystical level of conjunction as well. Yeah, because let's not also forget, because they have the mutual conjunction, this also means that he, oh my god, yeah, this actually confirms exactly something that I have explained in this other video. I don't remember exactly which one it was, but it was one of those where I talked about the Rahu K2 in Sinistry. I'm going to try to find it. Anyway, um, but you can check my playlist because I've done a lot of like Rahu K2 related <clears throat> videos. But anyway, what I wanted to say is that he is a K2 dominant person, all right? So... Let me just check one more time. So we have, yeah, Mercury, Sun. Yeah, there it is, right? Rahu in Capricorn. K2 means it's falling in Cancer. And again, in Vedic Astrology, just a brief parenthesis, as long as planets are in the same sign, they are considered to be conjunct. The stronger it is, like, um, the tighter the orb is between the two planets or points, the stronger the conjunction is going to manifest. But it is a conjunction either way, as long as they are in the same sign. Um, end of parenthesis. All right. So what I was going to say is he himself is a K2 dominant person because he has Sun and Mercury conjunct K2. Also, this is interesting because Ben Affleck actually always gave me the vibe of a, a Sun K2 man. <laughs> I again I'm also going to recommend but I'm going to list like all of the recommended videos related videos that I can think of in the video description so you can check them out. Uh I was going to say one more thing um that he is exactly um falling in the prototype of of the kind of men that I described in men with daddy issues. The video that I did the two videos that I did relatively recently um talking about this topic because he has the sun K2 conjunction. Anyway, um, but yeah, he is K2 dominant, which means that it explains why he would go for someone who also has aspects to his K2 because he's very stuck in his comfort zone, basically. It means that he's not exactly the kind of person that's throwing himself headfirst into the lessons that are, um, you know, being evoked here by the Rahu energy, right? 
So he likes to stay in his comfort zone, you know, and she is the comfort zone. She is kind of reinforcing that. And aside from that, let me see. It's also kind of funny to me that he has the moon Lilith conjunction. But again, would have to do more research with respect to how exactly this plays out in the natal chart. So won't dwell on that. Anyway, this is the sinistry. All right. But, but we do have the mutual moon Saturn here. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to be looking at their natal horoscopes a little bit. All right. So we have Saturn, Aries here, Saturn, um, Taurus, and Libra. Yeah, no, I was going to check for something, but I'm not seeing it check out. I was going to say that I was going to check if maybe they have um, in their natal horoscopes, they might have some kind of Saturn energy connected to um, their moon. But I'm not seeing it or it's not a strong aspect in any case. Let's see, Aries and Scorpio. Let me see. Maybe there are, uh, maybe they have that uh, Vedic aspect. I forgot what it's called, but there are these very specific aspects that I talked about. I think they're called the Rashi aspects, but I, I mentioned in another video that I don't really use them because, again, I haven't done extensive empirical research on them. And the the little research that I have done um, did not show them to be particularly relevant. So I feel like they would overcomplicate things. In any case, they do have the mutual Moon-Saturn opposition, which shows on the one hand that they trigger each other, um, you know, in, in a very, like, they really touch on each other's very deep, sensitive, emotional sides, because that's the Moon, right? And they perceive one another to be critical and controlling, <laughs> Which um, somehow, I guess, turns out to be a turn on or at least it's a binding aspect, you know, because I again, I have mentioned this in the videos that I did about Saturn and Sinistry that when you see a lot of Saturn, especially hard aspects like the conjunction, the opposition, um, also the square and to a lesser extent, the trine, the sextile and all that and the single sided aspects of Saturn. Um, but when you see a lot of Saturn in, in Sinistry, it's a very binding aspect. It means that the two people feel this kind of strong sense of purpose, of meaning connected to their connection. Like they really want to take care of one another. Like they have a sense of responsibility towards the other person, especially from the Saturn person. They might feel like they have to work things out with the planet person, in this case, the moon person. So again, especially since it's a double whammy, which most likely might show there's a connection in the composite, but I'm going to see when I get to that, um, right? So it, it it could definitely be, you know, an explanation for why they keep coming back to one another or they kept or they came back to one another. I don't know if they've had like multiple attempts, um, right? But there is a strong sense of, like, there's a, a higher meaning to this connection and somehow they are gaining from it. Let me check something. All right. We also have the Rahu. Oh, this one. So he has... All right. So this is his situation here. He has... Ascendant in Gemini. Hmm. With Venus. I'm not surprised. Because, like, the man... He looks like... Again, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing parentheses here. But, you know, I'm not surprised. Because he looks like someone who loves himself. You know what I mean? Um, I don't want to throw shade on my Venus and Ascendant people. <laughs> um, let me see. The Jupiter here. Mm-hmm. So she has Jupiter in Ascendant. Let me see of any aspects. We have seven, eight, nine. Oh, yeah. So there is a single-sided aspect to her to his Saturn from her Jupiter. Um, that could just show that somehow she brings more optimism. It also might feel from his perspective that she helps to fulfill his long-term plans. 
Yeah, which I know can be interpreted as, oh my god, he's a gold digger in some ways. I don't think that, honestly, looking at this sinistry again, as far as I have seen, I don't necessarily feel like gold diggerish energy from either person too strongly, but I'm gonna see as I go along. Ooh, another, like, okay, her Venus is in Taurus. What about his Jupiter? Yeah, so his Jupiter is in Sagittarius. All right, opposite her Venus. There it is. No, sorry, it's his Venus. All right, so it's not it's a, it's it's not aspecting. Let's see, seven. Actually, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, so his Jupiter is also aspecting her Saturn. Interesting. All right, so again, they both feel like somehow this connection is aiding their long term plans. And yeah, in a, some very pragmatic way, like they have more optimism together that things are going to get done. Also, uh, ultimately, I should have mentioned this also about the Venus Saturn conjunction that basically it's also a very binding aspect as well, just like the moon, um, just like the moon Saturn. All right. So they have a lot of binding Saturnian aspects. What can I say? And... Pretty much the, these are the main things. So I'm going to see if I notice anything as I go along. But these are the main things about the planetary overlays. And now getting into the houses and how they trigger each other's houses. Um, what I see here is his Jupiter falling in her fourth house. This could be triggering some kind of deep emotional connection here. Especially from her perspective, like she is emotionally attached. This could also mean that he just increases her happiness overall, you know. Um, yeah, like her sense of happiness somehow is increasing around this person and the, actually, let me see, Jupiter, yeah, pretty much, all right. The interesting thing that I noticed, though, is even though... Again, if you follow the tropical aspects, there is a square between their Jupiter signs. Um, but you don't even have to look at it from the tropical perspective. Even if you just look at the energies, because the the reality is that they are in different energies, all right? So we have a square energy between the, their Jupiter signs, which basically shows that their um, worldviews and maybe their belief systems are in conflict somehow. But that, of course, just like any other single aspect, does not mean that it has to be a deal breaker. It's just that they might run into conflicts with respect to, you know, coming from different cultural views, makes sense. Um, also, potentially a difference in religion, beliefs. Yeah. And anyway, that's just something that I noticed. And another thing is here... <clears throat> So his Rahu is falling into her fifth house, which triggers her desire for romance, sensuality, fun, um, maybe even her maternal instinct to some extent. Although I don't know if they have kids together. I don't think they have kids together. Do they? I'm not sure. Um, but in any case, this doesn't just have to do with kids. Let's not forget the fifth house is about creative arts. It's about, you know... Um, being dramatic and it's also about you know the dramatic arts literally so maybe again since we have the Rahu here this is like her feeling inspired by him romantically and also creatively um yeah so somehow he pulls her out of her comfort zone at least to some extent let me see some more yeah, I read, I, oh, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, yeah. Um, the Saturn falling in her ninth house, his Saturn falling in her ninth house. Um, again, this could be some kind of a limitation with respect to her freedom. Like, maybe she feels that his influence is um, restricting her movement somehow or her desire for expansion. I'm curious to see how long this lasts. 
Yeah, because it's interesting. They have an interesting synastry, but I feel like it's a combination between friendliness, like being really good friends, and uh, physical passion. I'm not getting like a very strong spiritual love here. I don't know, at least not so far. Anyway, also his Venus is falling in her 10th house. So this means that, I don't know, she sees him like arm candy in a way, you know, like somehow his um, charm and his, um, also not just his Venus, but his ascendant as well, falling in her 10th house, which is the house of career and social status and visibility it could just be that she likes the visibility of the connection like they she feels like together they are stronger as a social presence than they are individually um somehow you know she, he just adds to her social status to her money to her career ultimately somehow and his uh, his son and his Mercury falling in her 11th, again, increasing the gains, but she already has this conjunction in the 11th. So that explains a lot, actually, because, you know, this is a this is a conjunction that would definitely explain why she has made it very big in the world. Um, but he further, you know, increases this energy and also expands her visibility and her social circles, maybe. Oh, this one. <laughs> yeah. His Mars, again, this is what I'm talking about. All right, physical passion stuff. Um, because his Mars is falling in her 12th house. That would definitely activate the bedroom pleasures sector. Um, there might also be, I don't know, something of secrecy, something of mystery about him that she finds very appealing. It also can show that they feel like they have this very, especially from her perspective, she feels like they might have some kind of very deep, mystical, unspoken bond. This one, again, would explain a lot, to be honest. His moon falling in her second house. This could mean... I, I keep getting into mommy issues and daddy issues, but what can I do? What can I say? What can I do? This is what, this is, what is being pointed out here. So, um... What I'm seeing here is that she feels like there's a sense of um, home about him. Like, maybe he reminds her of one or both of her parents. One or both, all right? Like, there's some kind of a familiar vibe about him. This can also just show that he brings some kind of a sense of comfort and security. Um, on the other hand, though... She might also perceive him as someone that creates disturbances in her financial situation somehow, like, because the moon waxes and wanes, so it might bring some kind of ups and downs in savings, expenses, fixed assets somehow. Yeah. And maybe together as a couple, they also indulge in pleasures, um, like especially food. And yeah, this is pretty much what I can get. Let me see the other way around. So this one was with Ben outside. Let's say with Jennifer. So now that Jennifer is on top, let me see if I see any other new configurations. With respect to aspects, I'm not really seeing anything new, but with respect to overlays, let me check this. Again, we see that um, her conjunction falls in his second house. So there's a second house. I'm telling you these two, they're like each other's comfort food. <laughs> I mean, there's something going on where they just, uh, you know, they feel comforted by one another. There's something just that feels like home about this connection. And here we have Jupiter again. So they have... Each of them has Jupiter in the other person's um, fourth house, right? So increase of happiness, of comfort, of love. Um, Jupiter, sorry, fourth house is also the house of home and vehicle. So again, could increase each other's sense of comfort. Maybe they like to spend more time together when they are together, uh, more time at home when they, when they are together. And her ascendant is also falling here. Oh my God, They're, like the amount of mommy issues that I'm seeing here. I'm going to shut up, all right? Like, somehow his mother archetype is being triggered AF here, but her mother archetype is also triggered. So, 
I don't know. Um, yeah, this is what I'm seeing in any case. So yeah, they are they are comforting at least on the plus side. They are each other's comfort zone. And um, this one is kind of interesting here because her Moon Mars conjunction is falling in his sixth house. This might show arguments. Yeah, like he especially might be triggered, might become more argumentative. Maybe they get competitive with one another sometimes. Um, yeah. <laughs> there might be some instability with respect to um, everyday routines. Like, he might perceive her as someone who is a little bit too chaotic and disruptive with respect to everyday life. And let's see, aside from that, Rahu falling in the ninth house. He might feel inspired to grow intellectually or just expand his horizons through this relationship, like get to see other worldviews, maybe even get into like spiritual topics more. Saturn falling in his 11th, though, might show that he perceives her to be restricting his social circle. I don't know. Keep a, keep an eye out for rumors that he, you know, he's being isolated from his friends or something. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, but you never know, you know. And again, here we have here we have oh, this is particularly um relevant here because I just noticed that his, I just noticed that her Lilith is also conjunct his ascendant. Oh my god, the level of physical attraction these two must have, like, yeah. I'm surprised that they ever broke up, to be honest. Well, not entirely, because, you know, Lilith tends to do that, creates kind of impossible attractions. So anyway, back to this situation here. Um, this makes sense. What I was going to say is because the 12th house is the house of bedroom pleasures. Saturn is the planet of repressions. This actually even further explains why this aspect over here is very important because the Lilith conjunctions in Sinistry tend to be, you know, uninhibiting, especially when you have the conjunction to Mars or Venus. Especially with Venus, because with Mars it can get really nasty, all right? Um, so I feel like from his perspective, also her Venus being here, his Saturn is no longer alone and sad and depressed here. Um, because Venus is a friend of Saturn, right? So this is a really strong conjunction um, that is somehow healing for him. Like maybe, again, the intimacy is really good because again, this is the 12th house, the house of bedroom pleasures for him. So this affair, like there's some kind of a mystical secret, hidden, deep stuff happening, fusion happening in their intimate situations that is um, very addicting for him, no doubt. Probably mutually, but, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it from his perspective here. And this is, uh, all right, so this is pretty much what I can say about the overlays. What I wanted to say here about, let me check their um, dark Haraka situations here. Not just that, the moon, all right. So, so she has her moon in Scorpio. Look at this, yeah. She has her moon in 5 degrees Scorpio. He has his moon in 11 degrees Libra. So this is very strong with respect to the distance of the moon. I have talked about this again. I've done a whole uh, video. Um, I think it was titled Secrets of the Moon in Sinistry or in Relationships. And I've talked about how important it is, at least from the Vedic perspective, to have the distance from the man's moon to the woman's moon being shorter than the other way around. And in fact, the shorter it is, the better it is. So in this situation, it's really good. It is really good because they are literally less than 30 degrees apart here. Um, his moon being in Libra, her moon being in Scorpio. This means that she feels as, again, in a traditional heterosexual relationship. All right. Um, I don't necessarily, okay, traditional in quotation marks. It doesn't have to be traditional. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that because women biologically need to feel safe and secure in romantic relationships, um, this is a very strong aspect of compatibility because it makes the woman feel, you know, like the man understands her emotionally. He's probably the kind of person that, you know, is willing to 
meet her at least halfway, if not even all the way there, <laughs> like not just halfway, but like 70, 75% of the way, you know, like he might be waiting for her with her favorite drink by the time she gets home from work or whatever, the gym or whatever she does. Um, so basically this is something that, you know, greatly increases comfort. Again, more comfort. What can I say? <laughs> These two are like each other's spaghetti and meatball. Uh, meatballs or like cheeseburgers or whatever, any kind of comfort food you want uh, we want to think about. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of comfort and also she definitely feels like she is the more feminine person in this relationship also because his Mars is also squaring her moon, right? So this means that he is very physically attracted to her, but he may not always because of this square, he might sometimes be annoyed by her sensitivity and her emotions. So that cannot always play out well. But since she has a strong, pretty strong moon situation because it's backed up by her Mars, it's probably not going to affect her very much. Um, aside from that, with respect to their Dara Karaka situations... So I don't take Rahu as Karaka. I'm just realizing that it's the lowest degree here because other people have asked me, no, the Karaka has to be one of the seven planets. So in this situation, it's Jupiter, right? So this is his placement with the blue. His Jupiter is the Karaka, which is the... Um, which is the planet that shows the spouse archetype. And for her, it's... It's the moon. Yeah, I'm I'm actually not surprised. I mean, in a way I'm surprised, but in a way I'm not surprised. Um, the moon being dark, Karaka, would show that a person is actually quite emotionally needy in a relationship. Like, she needs a lot of comfort. And, oh, um, no, I was going to say something, but never mind. What I was trying to say is that she feels very contained, very comforted by his presence, all right? And that's very important to her because she has Moon as Dara Karaka. Let me check just one more time because I have a tendency to go ADHD and jump to conclusions here. Yeah, it is the Dara Karaka. It's the planet with the lowest degree. And yeah, this basically, oh my god, yeah. Uh, speaking of mommy issues, I have to go there. I have to, all right? Um... She is definitely getting, you know, I mean, they're both getting each other's parent archetypes triggered by this relationship, but I th feel for her it's particularly relevant because she has Moon as Dara Karaka. So this shows that she needs a lot of mothering, you know, she needs someone who is, you know, attentive and has a strong emotional bond with her and who's just there for her emotionally. Um, so it makes sense. It kind of makes sense, especially with the distance from his moon to hers. And with him, the Jupiter, though, being in Sagittarius, all right? So he actually likes someone who can expand his horizons. And also his Jupiter is falling in his seventh house, which makes it particularly strong, you know, with very strong influence connected to the kind of partner he likes. So he wants someone who can challenge him intellectually to some extent, but also someone who is, you know, expansive, wants to grow, um, also, you know, knows finances because Jupiter is one of the planets connected to wealth. But it's not just wealth. It's it's mainly about knowledge and it's about wisdom. Um, it's about world expansion like worldliness you know someone who is knowledgeable and has a rich array of experiences sorry about that so yeah this is pretty much what i can see from sinistry and what they how they interact how what attracts them to one another so i'm gonna try to look a little bit at the composite chart as well So this is the composite chart analysis. What I can say right off the bat, I'm not surprised that they have the Sun-Mercury conjunction here in Cancer because they have the double whammy. They have, you know, each of them have Sun-Mercury conjunct and then conjunct to each other. So clearly this conjunction is going to repeat in the composite. And again, if you're curious, I have done a separate video about this in depth, about how this aspect can play out and why it's so common in the composite chart 
like you wouldn't believe. Um, yeah, I would recommend that you watch that video. I'm going to link it in the video description, hopefully. Uh, if not, you can look for it in my synastry list. So it's just called Sun Conjunct Mercury in the Composite Chart. Um, and um, basically, this shows they have very good understanding. Like intellectually, they're actually very compatible. They probably are the kind of people that have very similar um, ways of thinking, similar um, humor. Um, they could probably talk about just about anything. So this is definitely a helpful aspect to have in synastry because it just brings a lot of good communication and i'm gonna see how it's backed up though because it, as i have mentioned in that video the big risk with this aspect is that it makes people think that they're more compatible than they actually are but you know i went more in depth in that video if you want to listen to it so this is a plus though it is a plus it shows that they have a nice friendship together yeah they're pretty comfortable around each other because they 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 know how each of them, you know, they know how to read each other's thoughts, you know, almost to that extent. Like, they probably finish each other's sentences. Uh, wouldn't be surprised, all right? And um, another strong one that obviously stands out is this one over here. We have the Moon-Jupiter conjunction. So, again, I should have checked, but I don't think they have kids together, do they? They were married. <laughs> Um, I mean, I know that they were together for a significant amount of time. I think they were married, right? I don't know, but I don't think they have kids together. In any case, this conjunction over here actually points out to the fact they, that um, th they may have wanted to have kids together uh, because this is a placement that shows it's one of those actually again I've mentioned it in another video where I where I described it as a fertility boosting aspect I've seen it a lot in the composite chart where if there is a any kind of connection but especially the conjunction between moon and Jupiter or moon and Mars um, you have the two people oftentimes will want to have kids together you know um, but even if there are no kids involved it could also again point to a great deal of I hate keep I hate to keep repeating this word, but a great deal of comfort, you know, a great deal of mutual understanding, um, love, affection. So overall, actually, this just shows a lot of wholesomeness and a lot of um, a very strong glue between the two of them, this conjunction, because it's just really soothing. You know, it's really um, see Jupiter shows it's the great benefic it's the optimism and the faith in the relationship and first of all these two planets are good for one another they have a friendly relationship and uh, when you see this conjunction in a natal chart it's called a, a gaj Kestri yoga and it's one of those yogas that are said to bring a lot of positive results in life including wealth but of course a lot has to be analyzed based on individual horoscopes in the composite chart, it would definitely show that they have a lot of optimism and faith. There's probably a sense of purpose together that they don't get when they are on their own. Um, and um, a lot of, again, intellectual co intellectual compatibility as well. So um, there could be, and again, the composite here actually shows a little bit more compatibility than the synastry because I mentioned that they had the square, they have the square in Sinistry. So here you actually see that, you know, when it's just them in as a unit between the two of them, you know, when nobody else is watching, they actually feel quite comforted by each other's belief systems and they feel right at home, you know? So they probably have a lot more in common than is actually, um, you know, immediately apparent. Let me put it like that. And another thing that really stands out, again, we have Lilith in, in the ascendant of the composite. I mean, holy moly. And also conjunct Ketu here. So we have Ketu in the ascendant, Rahu falling in the seventh. This could explain why they separated at first, but then ironically, it also explains why they feel drawn to one another. But in the composite chart, the seventh actually points towards people standing against them. So it could be like... <laughs> I don't know, like what got in between them was the entourage or the media or because Rahu also rules things like the media and, you know, um, well, not just the media, but public opinions. Let me put it like that. The seventh house shows how, to a large extent, 
people treat you together as a couple, you know, in the composite chart. And also how they are viewed as a couple is controversial. Like we have the Lilith here. And um, also with Keto a little bit unassuming. Like I feel like together they actually seem as a little bit more toned down a little bit at least than than they are when they are uh, separate um especially since Ketu also falls in uh in Maga Nakshatra but again won't get too into detail in any case the comp composite ascendant in Leo definitely showed that you know they still attract a lot of attention very much and and it's typical for a creative couple you know for a a couple that is famous to, to have this placement, you know, it just it just shows that people see them as very dramatic and very artistic and uh, also a little bit egomaniacal sometimes, self-absorbed, let me put it like that. Um, but also being a, a force to be reckoned with ultimately, so there are pluses and minuses. Uh, powerful presence, let me put it like that. Uh, also though, we have Saturn here in the... 10th house in Kritika Nakshatra. Um, this one is kind of interesting here. Like, I wonder if the reason, oh my god, like, it, it's really kind of, you know, I'm, I'm really getting a picture that they may have separated because of outside pressures. Um, it's like, this is potentially taxing. Again, maybe their, um, a relationship is being heavily criticized by people on the outside and um, also with the Saturn here it might show that each of them might suffer in their careers because of this relationship especially since uh, this is also um, aspecting Jennifer Lopez's moon because she has moon and um, moon and Mars in Scorpio so uh, on the one hand again it would add to that glue because not only does she has have sorry his Saturn opposite her Moon Mars conjunction, but she has the relationship Saturn opposite her Moon Mars natal Moon Mars conjunction, which shows that she's very much anchored by this relationship, but also sometimes feels restricted by it. And it, it, because we have the opposition, it's a this constant dancing of back and forth between feeling like, oh my god, I'm super committed to this relationship, it's absolutely worth it, and on the other hand, feeling like, oh my god, I just want to break free, <laughs> like I want to run away and never look back. Um, this is the kind of dynamic that you would see with, with Saturn Moon, uh, Saturn opposite almost anything, actually, but especially when you have it with, uh, with Mars or the Moon or the Sun. So this is what I would say about that. We have here the Venus in Gemini. Venus in Gemini here is a little bit lonely. Let me check what the situation is. So technically, again, if you look at it from the tropical perspective, we do also see a Mars-Venus square, which is the kind of thing that you would see in a very passionate affair situation. Um, we have because we have the composite Mars in Virgo, and the composite Venus is in uh, is in Gemini. So that's a square energy. So this would add to physical attraction and passion, but it's also a bit unstable and tumultuous, you know. But again, it hints to the common theme that this is probably a very passionate relationship when it comes to intimacy. So that would add to to why they are together, why they are attracted to one another. Um, let's see some more. All right, we also have Rahu aspecting Venus. So this is like somehow potentially increasing wealth and it's also potentially increasing uh, fame or at least uh, visibility for the both of them. And yeah, it's like together they are more appealing to a wider audience because of the foreign influences here. And also the media, the media, because Rahu rules the media. All right. One thing that I can say is, also let's not forget that his moon, so both of their horoscopes are very triggered by the composite, and this is another 
sign that this relationship is very meaningful and hard to let go for for both of them but him especially he has his moon conjunct the moon jupiter conjunction here in libra so that means that he is actually very emotionally comforted and also very attached to this relationship like he feels like this relationship is somehow meeting his needs on a very basic level And again, I don't want to say mommy issues, but I'm going to say mommy issues. <laughs> That's all. I'm just going to leave it hanging over there, right? Because I'm not here to talk about Ben Affleck's mommy issues. <laughs> I don't even know because I don't know his situation uh, with respect to his upbringing. I'm just saying that whenever you see the moon heavily conjuncted um, in Sinistry, there are any issues you might have about your mother or something are being triggered in that connection. So if he has a, a good relationship with his mother it just feels comfort com it feels like comfort comforting to him let me check some more here yeah so we have gemini we also have a trine yeah we do have a trine we're in jupiter here yes of course so we have so jupiter even in uh, vedic it aspects the fifth the seventh and the ninth from itself so it aspects if it falls in air signs like in here it aspects all the other air signs so Jupiter also aspects, uh, you know, there's a, there's the mutual aspect actually between Rahu and Jupiter, nice, um, and it's actually basically what you would call a grand trine, you know, at least what tropical astrologers would call a grand trine here happening. So this would even further point to a deeper relationship, but I'm not going to get into that grand trine theory. It's just, you know, it's a lot of mutual aspects and a lot of um purpose being shown by these aspects you know because if you would just see like a bunch of planets completely unaspecting each other um yeah that would probably not lead to a long long-term relationship definitely not the kind where people are going to come back to one another after a break um so yeah but what i was going to say is the jupiter is aspecting the venus so that's very positive again because again just like the rahu aspecting the venus it just shows that venus's energy is being increased here in the composite within the relationship so that means more pleasure more hedonism more love um also more love as time goes by as well and more sensuality and more wealth of course <laughs> and um also venus just shows that the Jupiter Venus connection shows that they become more artistically creative. They also just become more refined potentially and like more interested in developing their artistic abilities. And here, uh, see, remember that in the Sinistry, you in the in the chart inter aspects part of Sinistry, um, you see the negative you know, the negative um, aspects between Mars and Saturn. But here we have a trine between Mars and Saturn. So that explains why, despite the potential uh, pitfalls of the Mars-Saturn configurations, you ultimately see that the connection works, at least to the point where they keep coming back to each other, which is impressive. Because, like, if you would just see couples who have, like, mutual Mars-Saturn oppositions, for instance, <laughs> or let's say one of them has Mars squared, the other person Saturn, the other one has Mars opposite, the other one Saturn, um, and you would not have, you know, amicable co configurations in the composite between these two planets, you would probably not see them coming back to, to each other. They would just break off uh, completely, you know? So, yeah, we do have this uh, Mars Mars Saturn trine, which actually so shows that they work well together ultimately, and it's adding to durability. So there's ultimately within the relationship, there is a compatibility between their long term goals and their immediate drives, like their passions and all this. And they have a lot of endurance together as well. They might have like higher endurance. Um, as a couple with respect to going after their plans and all that than they do on their own. Yeah, so I think this is pretty much it. Like, these are the main configurations. But there are definitely, this one is, I would say, more than enough. Um, this one, the Moon-Jupiter conjunction and the Sun-Mercury conjunction, these are more than enough to explain a long-term relationship, to be honest. 
With respect to Saturn, not only do we have the trine, sorry, the trine to Mars, um, but let's see if there are other aspects actually happening as well. There is a mild sextile to the Sun as well between, yeah, Saturn and, and the Sun in Cancer and Mercury in Cancer. So again, there's a sextile energy here and uh, with Libra, all right, this is not a strong aspect. There is a square to the Ascendant, though. Yeah. And the square to the North Node. Um, I would intuitively say that this, again, could increase um, hardships for both of them, you know, mostly coming again from something like social pressure, visibility, stuff like that. Like, I feel like really people around them or just the world have, you know, has, has weighed too heavily on their relationship and maybe that's why they broke up to begin with. And it's probably going to continue to, you know, weigh heavily um, on them. But, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, how well they handle it. But, yeah, this is pretty much what I have to say, really, about their composite chart. And actually about their whole sinistry situation and I hope that you will enjoy this again please let me know in the comments if you thought that this um, way of explaining things is a little bit more interactive than usual meaning if you would prefer this way um, of like me moving the mouse on the screen if it makes a difference or if it's just as good if I leave the photos <laughs> and just do it statically all right in any case, if you have enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, subscribe, click on the notifications bell to see when I will post a new video. Also, if you're interested in a private reading or becoming a member or any other extra information or finding out about my tarot channel, check out the video description. I will leave all the relative uh, relevant, sorry, information, video description, and also the introductory part of the video where I will describe membership options more in depth and other information about how to get a reading and such. All right. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you in my next video.